welcome you all to The Gateway. The Gateway is a video podcast directed and hosted by staff members of Somerset Community College's student newspaper, The Bridge. This is The Gateway. Thank you for joining us today with The Gateway and Offshoot of The Bridge. I'm your host, David Turner, and today I have a paradox, Dr. Lisa Day and Dr. Travis Martin. Uh, here joining us today. How are you all doing? Good. Good. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Day and Dr. Martin here uh, talking about uh, Dr. Martin, who is founding director of the Kentucky Center for Veteran Studies uh, at EKU, um, previously serving as a sergeant in the U.S. military. Um, and you did two tours during the Iraqi War, mm-hmm. correct? Okay. Uh, and then after that, you moved uh, out of the military and got your uh, bachelor's and master's from EKU and your PhD in literature from UK, correct? And importantly, my associate's degree from Somerset Community College. Yeah, you're always alumni coming back. We, we always have alumni coming da- back. I love hearing the success stories. That's really awesome. Are you from Somerset? I am. Nice. Okay. Okay. Are you from Somerset? I'm not. You're not? No. Mammoth okay. Cave. From Mammoth? Okay. So you, you traveled a bit. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, so, uh, you taught, uh, at EKU previously, uh, you did American War Literature, Masculinities of War, uh, and Intro to Veteran Studies, um, and Veteran Identity Theory, right? right? Okay. Uh, and now you're the author of, uh, War and Homecoming, which is SCC's Common Reads book for 2023-2024, mm-hmm. which is really exciting for the conversation that starts in... Uh, how we as a society kind of uh, interact with veterans uh, post-service because that's a big conversation that really needs to be had and should have been had 60 years ago and, and just has continued to kind of falter in time. Sure. So, you know, <clears throat> somebody from here, I think, about the students that go to college at SCC are likely going to interact with veterans that are coming home. And exactly. My hope is that their families are strengthened by that knowledge. And that's beautiful. Um, you started the first veterans creative nonprofit. Uh, I would say it was the first. It was a creative arts nonprofit. It was a creative I, arts nonprofit. Okay, um, which is awesome because that also because cre- when you were talking to me about it, you said that uh, it brought in professional artists who to help uh, veterans who were coming back from service to you know pursue their their artistic uh, means of out outlets. Yeah, uh, which is beautiful. Um, and what have you been doing since then? Well, uh, I ran that uh, nonprofit, which was called Military Experience in the Arts, until uh, about 2015. Uh, at that point in my life, I was working on a PhD and teaching at two different schools, and I just had a lot going on, so I had to step away. Uh, during that time with the nonprofit, we published about uh, 500 works of literature, artwork, and scholarship by and about veterans in about eight different books, and so that was still out there can be downloaded and read by anyone okay they put more importantly than the publication is the veterans got a chance i think to you know engage in the act of homecoming that i talk about in the book which is telling their story and having that story received by an audience that's ready to hear it okay. um, and sometimes that takes literary form and other times that takes conversations and um you know, it, it takes a lot of different forms, homecoming, and that's that was just one. And so after I, I stepped away from that, I finished my doctorate in 2017, um, went back to EKU and started working in the Veteran Studies program that I had also founded in, in 2011. Okay. Um, and uh, did that up until last year, and currently in, got a little tired of academic administration. Uh, Fair higher ed's a, a rough a rough place to work, as my partner can attest. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I got into something I'm also passionate about, which is suicide prevention. It's big in the veteran community, but yeah. it's also impacted my, my immediate family. My brother died by suicide on my second deployment. Oh, wow. I talk about that in the book and how it, 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 was, a, it was a rough experience. Yeah. And it still is coping with that. Yeah. And so I found that, you know, this was something I had teaching abilities and I had a, a, an outlet through the trauma and suicide prevention clinic at EKU. And so okay. I started doing that on the side. And, I'm doing that, and I'm, I'm focusing on, uh, you know, just the veterans community in Madison County, where I live. I've been working at the DAV part, uh, volunteering a few days a week, and, okay. um, and that's kind of my current focus, uh, working within the veterans community and suicide prevention. Okay, and that's, um, and you're right, because it, it, one, suicide rates statistically are higher amongst, veteran, uh, amongst veterans, um, something like 20 a day, 23, 23 a day. 23 22 a day, a day is 22. the usual saying. It, honestly, the research is, is it, it goes back and forth. Right. It could be as low as 
you know, 40 a day to as much as like, uh, you know, 12. Uh, and I think I said that backwards, but the idea. Right, is, yeah. But the, the general mm -hmm. consensus in, the, in, the, in, in popular culture is 22 veterans die a day by suicide. Right. And that's a, I think that's a reasonable uh, rallying cry. Yeah. And, and no need to get bogged down in the numbers. No, correct, yeah. Well, I think even without being bogged down by the numbers, you see a number like that, especially with the work that goes into being an active duty service member. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and coming back from that, not knowing necessarily that integration. You know, I've, I uh, obviously we've all got family members who, you know, come back from overseas and have you know varying issues with with integrating back into civilian life. Well, the um, more you learn about veterans, the more you learn about humans, because veterans right. are just human beings, right? Right. And so, in suicide prevention, you learn a lot of things that uh, people that are having suicide thoughts think, uh, such yeah. as feeling like they're a burden, feeling like they're alone. Um, not feeling like they've got a future or a clear sense of purpose. These are all things that veterans, when they're transitioning out of the military, experience in abundance. Right. And so it's amplified in a way. Yeah. And so if you learn about veterans' culture and the reasons they feel these things, uh, it's, it's such extremes, the same reasons that raise their rates, yeah. um, you also learn about humans just in general. Yeah. And so I tell people this, it's not just about veterans and when I was teaching veteran studies. Right. If we could stop like saying it's us and them, that right. we could really solve a lot of our problems. So, okay. Yeah, it, it's um, it's helpful to understand what veterans go through, but in doing so, it's you're also just learning about the extremities of human experience. Right. Because that's what military service is. Okay. Um, and that's all explored in War and Homecoming, right? Mm hmm Okay, and War and Homecoming was published in 2022? Correct. By the University Press of Kentucky? Yep. Yep. Uh, and SCC has picked it for its common read again, like I mentioned. Um, and it, it talks about how we acknowledge and support veterans as they, you know, discover... Uh, their individual identities post-service. Um, and what does it mean for you? Because this is your first, it's not your first uh, writings, because you've done tons. I've, I've, I've seen your JSTOR. There's, there's a lot of stuff you've written, but this is your first book, right? Right. So how does it feel having your first book uh, selected for common reads through the Penguin uh, Random House uh, common reads program? It, like I said earlier, the biggest honor is knowing that it's going to bring knowledge to families that are going to support veterans. Um, that, but knowing that my work has also been picked up by the place that I was my site of homecoming, you know, yeah. and it's being read in the same professors' classes, and the mm -hmm. students that are in the same traveling in similar paths to me are also going to be uh, in a community that you know has this knowledge now. I, I hope that that somebody you know picks up something that can go out there and change a life, and I, I don't know what that something will be. Hopefully, it's something different to everybody. Right. Um, but. Um, being able to come back to, like, say, uh, Lynn Shearer's Somerset Community College class at Plast County High School, which is quite where I graduated from high school, <laughs> and see students there reading books and yeah. asking serious questions. Yeah. Uh, you know, what I remember about high school was, like, throwing paper towel rolls at the <laughs> assemblies. Yeah. And uh, it, it gives you a bit of hope, you know, seeing yeah. the younger generation, like, take these things seriously. And, uh, and it kind of proved my point that I say in the book is, like, uh, if people are willing to listen, veterans will tell their story. You yeah. know, and if you put off the vibes that you're not, or if you don't equip yourself with the skills sometimes, yeah. you're not ready to listen. And right. then, you know, that's that's your personal responsibility, you know. And seeing students take that on, be like, yeah, I want to learn more. Yeah. I want to do more. And I want to be there if a veteran comes up to me and says, hey, I'm struggling. Mm -hmm. That's what it's all about. Do you know, so, because I want to emphasize when you were talking about, you know, their story, you know, talking about stories, um, I'm in fact at a Kappa. You were a faculty advisor for the National Arts, or for the Honor Society uh, Alpha Lambda Delta, mm -hmm. right at EKU. Yep. Uh, so PTK uh, is obviously the SEC equivalent of uh, Alpha Lambda Delta. I was in PTK. Uh, you were in PTK too. Mm -hmm. So awesome. Uh, <laughs> so you probably know. Uh, when did you come to SEC? Uh, well, the first time when I stopped out to go to the military was 2002, and then I came back in 2007. Okay, because there might still be some people affiliated with PTK who might, you know, who might know you still. I gave a talk um, to the group last year. Oh, did you? That's yeah, awesome. I took a general professional development talk. It was okay, pretty, pretty nice. That's pretty really nice awesome. group. Um, uh, and the reason why uh, I bring up Phi Theta Kappa is because this. <laughs> this <Remember semester>. <laughs> this uh, this year's uh, project for Phi Theta Kappa, which I'm sure you're uh, common, you, you know of because of being a, a previous member, is the power of stories. Um, and storytelling being such an important thing, 
Uh, was that always something when you were getting out of the military and, and going back for your bachelor's, going for your master's? Was literary, was literature always what you kind of wanted to do? Was yeah. to tell stories? Well, I think it's ingrained in our culture in Appalachia, if you think about it. And you know, my partner could tell you all about how storytelling, oral traditions, and things like that is ways that we uh, codify and both reify our, our, our culture here. Okay. And so that was always, that's how we tell people who we are. Um, and I talk about in the book is like little kids, you know, how they tell their parents about their day. But it's just generally a big part of our culture is storytelling okay. here. And so I had that growing up here. Yeah. Getting out, uh, I had PTSD, which I, I've been very open about and right. happy to talk about. But, you know, I noticed in my therapy is this pattern of storytelling. Uh, yeah. Prolonged exposure was one. That's where you come in and you would recount a really traumatic event into a tape yeah. recorder and listen to it and do it again and again and again and again until it didn't hurt anymore. Yeah. Or, uh, you know, most, a lot of ex- therapies involved exposure to the thing that stressed you out. Right. And so over time, the idea is you build resilience to that. Right. You get more control. Um, and so I noticed that storytelling would provoke an emotion, which I found very hard to control. I still do sometimes uh, when I first got out. But I, I did notice that, you know, in the literature that I was reading about war in my classes, like, the events were way worse than what I was going when I went through like Tim O'Brien or right. somebody like that uh, that just has these graphic experience and I started thinking to myself well if I'm having trouble like talking about this stuff in therapy how the heck did they spend years just sitting down yeah. and write about it you know like it seemed to was that helpful like to be able to tell the story unfragmented to be able to take those memories and put them together in order and have control over them right. it seemed to be the goal of the therapy was to do that and these literary uh, geniuses had been doing that naturally so I got into studying that Okay. Uh, that was my, my angle. You get your niche if you're a literary scholar. Right? right. And so I was into 20th century American war literature with a okay. focus on uh, trauma. Okay. Up until my, up in, you know, probably midway through my PhD program, I kind of shifted more into like social theory and veteran identity on a kind of scale. Right. But mostly it was kind of personal at first for me as part okay. of my understanding. Okay. And you were able to kind of, and obviously you've built that out into a career now, being able to tell these stories and, and helping others, you know, not just through your work, but but through your nonprofit and, and through your uh, work. I would just imagine even as part of like getting into like suicide prevention and talking to people who are, you know, in struggle of, of you know, things like that, of how they can communicate to, to process their emotions, process whatever it is that they, you know, traumas or, or, or whatever they are, are facing in those moments. It's probably all you find part a, of that storytelling. You find us, yeah, you find the same thread in the suicide prevention models. It's yeah. about getting a person who's having suicide thoughts to stop mm-hmm. and acknowledge directly and openly that they're having those thoughts and then getting them to talk to you and tell their story. It's about listening to that story more than anything, though. And that's why a lot of people miss out on it's like it's we only need a model because we don't listen naturally we're always too busy we're too superficial we're too, right we got our own problems yeah you know everybody's got a you know, hard life when you if you really want to look close yeah um but you know if you teach yourself to really and authentically like look at these exchanges as both good for the veteran and good for you and good for your society which the, all those things are true yeah. uh, it becomes less of a chore to kind of stop and listen and more of kind of like an imperative that's what I hope to you know, get across to people, young people anyway, when I'm teaching. Do you think that that is societal to like the United States or, or in your studies, have you found that other cultures have different ways of handling uh, veterans? You know, I think there's conscious and unconscious processes that work. And I talk a lot, you know, there's recent history and there's, there's ancient history, right? But ancient right. history would show that veterans are kind of a force that comes back from war that people are scared of, that they have a lot of potential to go either way, you okay. know? got a lot of talent I call it skills and scars in one of the articles I wrote about myself okay uh, you know I brought back a ton of skills as an army sergeant right I brought back a ton of baggage right. as an army sergeant right you know scars uh, but you know societies look for ways to kind of channel those energies into productive means so, you know our VA system is an example of that here uh, you know we give student we have college money to veterans coming back so they'll go out right and, and do creative and great things and they have yeah they've been the leading force that made America a superpower veterans have right um, but, you know, unconsciously, there's also the fear is still there. You know, there's this undercurrent of, like, the, the viewing veterans as kind of a victim class or that they're ticking time bombs and yeah. that they're potentially unstable. And you see this come out in our media, and I studied a lot of this and wrote a lot of shorter articles about right. that. 
Um, it's, 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 it's this thing that if we don't acknowledge, it can kind of like inform our policy. It can inform our ways of thinking and uh, unconscious ways that make us avoid conversations with vets. Right. That's, where, that's where the theory meets the practice, right? Yeah. Do you think that part of that research becomes politicized? course yeah, yeah and that, and, you know, great a great deal and you know that's something that kind of turned my direction personally as a researcher from like the personal experience of trauma into this kind of social theory and the appropriation of veteran identity it's like you got all these veterans trying to recover but at the same time you got all these lot more powerful organizations and people and political parties that are trying to tell veterans what they are for their own uh, narrative that they need to create and that narrative may be counter to the veterans well-being and veterans often fall prey to that. And they've been falling prey to that since the foundation of this country. You can go back and read that. There's a really good book called The History of the GI Bill. Okay. I encourage people to look up the history of veterans' benefits and how after every conflict, there's a bunch of swindlers waiting for those veterans to get back. They take advantage of it? Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, do you mind if I ask Dr. Day a question no, real quick? Please. So, um, your partner to a veteran, mm-hmm. um, as part of his process of, of getting into civilian life and, and your role in that because you have also you know an, an educator and stuff where do you think that education kind of bridges that gap for uh, veterans who are trying to reintegrate into civilian life post service sure that's a good question um, I've often said since the early days of my career that I love having veterans in my classes because they pay attention yeah. <laughs> better than any of the other students they meet deadlines and they produce high quality work because they're so thoughtful right? and they care about being there. Um, part of the benefit of going into, edu- you know, going into their education after they have finished their, their tours of duty um, is that it, it, it gives them a group community, it gives them a small community in their classes. Right. Each one is its own community. Um, so they they have those dynamics down pat uh-huh. group identity you know and their role within the group um they get frustrated sometimes when the class isn't the kind of community right that they've always experienced and that falls on often the professor to foster that kind of community right um you know some other things that uh greatly benefit veterans coming out of the service is it an increasing uh, push toward a veteran community at yeah. the university? So veterans groups, like even study groups right. or social groups, where veterans from all different areas can come together and host events and to participate in, in memorials okay. um, and to commemorate anniversaries. Mm-hmm things like that Um, so they can continue that cohesion with other veterans who didn't serve with them but they've got all these things in common and you know again when they come to their classes and (laughs) they share their stories like Travis was talking about um, it teaches all of the other students such valuable lessons Mm -hmm. yes not only in the experiences they're willing to share, but also how to frame their own experiences in a way that inspires change, like Travis was talking about. Okay. Uh, And EKU has a veterans, like student organization, right? Travis Uh, has a better answer to that. Yeah, their student organizations are, I think there's two there. They're typically run under the EKU, Office of Military and Veterans Affairs. Okay. Uh, If anyone wanted to talk to someone there, you'd look up Vincent Thomas. He's the director. Vincent Thomas, okay. And that's exciting because obviously we have, you know, veterans who go to SEC currently who might transfer to EKU. So then being able to integrate into, you know, higher education and going for their bachelor's degrees and having people that they can readily reach out to. Um, you went to UK. Does UK, do you know if they have they do. Uh, a veterans program as well? Like, or uh, yeah, it's, it's, organization? It, they, uh, I forget the person's name who runs. I think it's changed since, uh, since I've been there. But they, they also have a, a Office of Military and Veterans Affairs. And I would also point out SEC students that there is a veteran space here on the main campus. Okay. Here at Somerset. Um, it's uh, located in the Mies building, I believe. Okay. Um, given the classes that you've taught, 
Um, and I really liked the idea of the ungrading because mm-hmm. uh, I, I read into your to your uh, class on, on the intro to veteran uh, studies uh, being more of a uh, hybrid like uh, almost like a capstone kind of in the way that the the des- the des- the purpose of the class was for people to be able to, d- to demonstrate uh, you know kind of the the material you know through the oral presentation through the different class conversations that you had um how do uh those type of classes like if we could have classes like that be was their design not necessarily as like for a grade um because this is more of a topic it's a special topic in, in a way where you're you know trying to teach people in higher education how to communicate with veterans, how to communicate with, and like you say, this goes further than that, goes with, you know, just your fellow man in general. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, where do we currently falter in having these kind of conversations in higher education? This is a great question. I I love that you combine ungrading in the the intro to veteran studies course. So give you a little bit of primer on ungrading and how I use it. Basically, ungrading relies on intrinsic motivation. It's the idea that if you're motivated from within inside to do something, you're going to do a better job. A grade is a form of extrinsic motivation. It's really a a label or a form of punishment. And so uh, if you think about like in terms of a weight analogy, if you weighed 150 pounds and you lost 50 pounds, how much would you weigh? You know, you'd weigh 100 pounds. Yeah. Grades kind of like say, no, you make mistakes along the way and you get penalized for them. And at the end of the day, you don't end up weighing 100 pounds. You weigh like 70 pounds because you made 30 more one point mistakes along the way to losing that weight. Right. So it kind of conditions you in a way that intrinsic motivation does it. Because at the end of the day, the reward is coming from someone else, the teacher, or it's coming from the grade that you've been conditioned to get a serotonin boost or whatever every right. time you get an A. Or when you take that grade home and you show your parents, you know, you're conditioned from an early age to do these extrinsic motivators. Yeah. Kind of like a carrot and a stick kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> um, so ungrading the way I did it was, you know, I, you know, there's still standards. People yeah. think it's just anarchy. You just throw everything in the trash at the end of the day. It wasn't. It's actually a lot more work for a teacher. And I realized I was already doing it as a teacher for one thing. I would always give students a lot of second chances. So I would just yeah. give them like, okay, this paper is not where it needs to be to pass. I mean, and they're like begging you with their big eyes and all that stuff, you know. And I, you, you blow it off. But at the end of the day, I would get, say, I tell them what's wrong with it, give them a lot of feedback, and send it back to them. They'd bring it back. And they'd do the same thing again, you know. And I ended up doing this three or four times. And I realized, you know what, what's the point of even doing the grades if right. I'm just going to keep giving them chances? Right. And so I started trying to like change my classes around where it was focused on that uh, kind of growth model. Okay. And, and, and so, like, Instead of like uh, me giving them a grade, I give them a set of standards that they have to meet in order to get the assignment done. Okay. There's a there's a you know like a C level that you know this is you meet the standard you're good you get a check mark. All right, and then there was like an expert level, you know, and then there was like a, a level below where it's like here's what's wrong you need to fix it if you want your check mark. It's okay. Still an extrinsic motivator right. to a degree, right? Well, they had every assignment was like that. There was a lot of assignments, extremely hard class, but I didn't right. make them do all the assignments. Right. I said, choose the ones you want. Okay. All right. So there was like, uh, they could do a bare minimum of 50%. And I was like, okay, this is what all the students are going to do is a bare minimum. Wasn't true at all. Uh, a lot of students were doing them every week. Okay. And it's like the discussion boards and stuff that normally they would see as a chore, uh, they would get in there and know that there wasn't going to be any consequences for trying. Right. You know, you may say, well, there's no consequence for trying. You can't just go in and make stuff up. Well, they didn't have to do that. So they right. didn't. That's what they would do if they were forced. And okay. So then they also had more energy to expend on other things that they were interested in in the class, like the oral history project that right. everybody did. And that's the big, that was that the was big, big project, one. right? So okay. everyone, we had an oral historian named Neil Kasiak who came in and it would teach them how to ask questions in interviews similar to this one. He would teach the importance of oral history, like I talked about in the Appalachian culture earlier. You know, and I, he would basically, we would prime these students to find a veteran in their life uh, and their family, where they work, at, uh, in their other classes, wherever it was, and go in and authentically listen to them and want to know what they went through. And not just go in and, like, do some fluff, like, hey, uh, I'm doing a class at EKU, and uh, we're really thankful that you serve, and we want to take a selfie with you and post it on our website. Yeah. You know, some crap like that. Veterans, it's not like they don't like that, but it doesn't ultimately accomplish anything no. other than making the person who gets the selfie feel good about themselves. Yeah. Which is good for them, you know. I'm glad it's better than that and spitting on them, huh? Um, but 
uh, at, the, at the end of the day, uh, these students would uh, pick people usually close to them. Uh, right. Uh, and, uh, you know, at first I was like, oh, I wish they'd get out in the world and explore. But honestly, what I learned was that they were getting people in their immediate family that they hadn't really de- talked about this stuff with, fathers, mothers, brothers, sisters. Um, and they were getting people in their classes that maybe it was first semester of college. Yeah. And they were going, like one, one kid uh, was at Kroger and just saw a guy with a Vietnam veteran hat on and asked him, <laughs> went to his house, recorded the interview. And he learned so much about the American country. Like it surprised him that the veteran said he had to hide that he looked like a veteran when he got back if he wanted to get a job. I mean, he grew up after 9-11, and you know, like a lot of students that I taught, you know, they grew up with American flags on their door porch, you yeah. know, their porch steps and everything. And they were just not thought of that a veteran would be regarded anything other than as a hero. And so just knowing that that, knowing that the, uh, the identity of a veteran changes was both something I was harping on in class, and it was something they were seeing in the actual veteran themselves they talked to. Uh, sorry about that. No, you're good. You get so into it, and I, yeah. I'm sitting here thinking about you know veterans and, and stuff because I have a, a cousin who came back and <clears throat> I idolized him growing up. This is kind of an aside, and she, me and her have talked about about Brian before and how uh, you know kind of the way that we we have because you said post 9-11 really changed a lot of perspectives you know for a lot of people you know i'm in my 30s so for me my cousin he was in uh kuwait is where he was during during the war uh but i you know i did four years or rotc i was like i I got i want to be just like him you know my my grandfather was in the army cousins in the army i gotta i'm gonna join the army you know so it, it was kind of like this you know way that now that we talk about it versus you know back in the day uh you know when it was you know not necessarily the best thing to be a veteran especially post like vietnam and korea where you know people had such stark different opinions of military service from that period versus you know now um well here's the weird thing man i I thought that that attitude was gone too but I, i learned is especially i got around people with more privilege in higher education that attitude's very much still alive, that veterans are losers, that they couldn't hack it in the real world. Right. And so while, you know, we have a very patriotic sentiment superficially that we have to be very vigilant, that uh, we're, we're aware of the skills that veterans bring back, that they're not regarded just as the, the tropes that we see in our media. Right. Because that, again, that's not going to go away. Again, back to antiquity, uh, veterans, when they come back, are going to have a little bit of fear around them. They're going to yeah. be regarded in terms of their potential. Potential can go a lot of different ways. Yeah. Do you know, um, because we're talking about, like, the the skills that are brought back, because I know, uh, unfortunately, a lot of skills that veterans come back with that are taught through, like, MOS schools and things like that don't necessarily correlate. They'll, you know, they'll say, you know, oh, you've got all this education, you know, from the military, but it doesn't count. You're still going to have to get a degree or whatever. You know, I don't necessarily agree with that, but I know that that is a thing that does continually happen. Um, I think we've come a long way with that. I wouldn't agree that military experience is the equivalent to a college degree. Uh, for example, general education is, uh, I think, very important for equipping a populace to speak the same language and understand ideas across disciplines. Um, you get a form of that in the military in terms of cross-cultural explorations and uh, learning about different languages and cultures and people in the military. I learned more Spanish in basic training than I learned in four years of high school. Right. But is that the same thing as going to college? I don't think so. But Veterans do get credit for their training. They get, you know, everybody gets some for basic training. And based on the complexity of your MOS, you will get more and more credit. I think I got, like, something of, like, 16 to 20 credits as an Army truck driver. Well, that's good. So it knocks out a couple of semesters. But one thing it also takes away is the opportunity to explore more electives, I find. So right. It's, it's catch-22. You okay. can only use your benefits towards credits that go towards your degree. And so once your credits are filled up with your right. electives. Then you're stuck. you, you got to take exactly what you're, you can take yeah. towards your degree. Okay. Do you know... Um, how does that affect things like, because obviously, you know, with the GI Bill and being able to pursue education, you know, uh, past, you know, serve when you're, when you're post-service, um, what about things like, uh, I know the Army has green to gold for people who are enlisted who want to go from, you know, being an, uh, an enlisted member of the military to being commissioned as an officer in the military. Um, how does that affect uh, the educational path uh, of integrating into society for people who, you know, might not necessarily be out of service at that time, 
but are still trying to pursue that higher education, trying to pursue, uh, you know, their next steps, you know, and maybe preparing for whenever they do inevitably leave military service. Yeah, for veterans, a lot of times it's about not knowing what you don't know. And so uh, when you get out of the military, you're thinking about a lot of things, and based on the complexity of your life, you'll have more or less energy to focus on uh, higher education and uh, your future five years from then. You may, maybe you just had your first kid. Maybe you're like me and dealing with PTSD. Uh, maybe you, uh, you're, I don't know, maybe you got some sort of inactive reserve requirement, you know. Uh, uh, that you don't know if you're going to get called up again. I think that's. Right. I think they phased that out. But I, I was one of those that got home and had a yellow envelope on my door one day. Trying that to IRR. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you never know. Is the point I'm trying to make is like you're 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 very precarious when you first get out. Uh, yeah. And so uh, you have all these programs like uh, you know the green to gold. You know, say you, you want to go from enlisted to officer, you can do that. You can go to Skill Bridge now, which is like yeah. a program where the federal government will pay uh, an employer your salary for a while, let you stay in the military while you're transitioning into a new career path. Okay. Um, you have the GI Bill, of course. You have vocational rehab, which is how I got my PhD paid for. Okay. You know that you, if you've got a certain level of disability, you can uh, pick a job. I, I chose that I want to be a college educator. Okay. And they'll they'll pay for that track if you're qualified for the benefit. And there's lots of state level benefits, and it's like you're inundated with all this information, but you're also inundated right. with a lot of information about lesser benefits that don't really uh, help you, or they kind of sidetrack you. And veterans get again swindlers, you know, they get looped into these like uh, these these uh, corporations or for profit entities that are basically trying to like funnel resources that they're not really making to the veteran, and they're kind of playing middleman, and the veteran's paying a fee. Or it's like they're, they're they're outside the gate waiting with these high interest rate loans or something like that. It's like everywhere you look, it's like veteran is now suddenly like this uh, localized sort of fame that carries benefits and a lot of uh, potential like uh, mishaps. And so you're in a position where you need to make good decisions those first few years. Okay. I think college is a great place to do that, honestly. It uh, really kind of keeps you on the rails if you stay focused on moving forward one semester at a time. How do you think society plays in? Because you say we have these swindlers who take advantage, you know, in the civilian world of swindlers <laughs> of veterans and, and veteran benefits who, who try to take advantage of that. How do you think that we can uh, attack, I guess, those uh, that falter in society and how we handle veterans and, and veteran benefits and, and helping veterans get the most of you know their service and post-service uh, yeah. benefits that they have well here's an example I, I like telling stories right so um last year when i, I left my work to be honest I, I left to focus on my mental health and i started a group and one of the veterans i didn't start the group i started I joined a group a mental health group at the va and one of the veterans in it had been in treatment for several years um but he and he, he wasn't he was getting treatment from the VA, but he wasn't receiving compensation for what was very cl clearly PTSD related to right. Vietnam era service, and so he didn't understand why, and he thought all of us were just going to treatment and getting paid you know a compensation check. Right. But it's like the VA has three different branches, um, and every person that that person interacted with never bothered to inform him. Uh, all the veteran service organizations officers never informed him. Uh, none of the people that, you know, worked at the desk informed him. None of his doctors informed him. None of his therapists informed him. I was the first person to tell him and his group that, hey, man, there's a claims process that you have to go through. And it's a very complicated and arduous process. And that you are entitled to benefits that the voters all around us uh, ask Congress to pass through the spending bills. And you should not feel ashamed right. to seek out these benefits. In fact, you should be encouraged yeah. and enabled to seek out these benefits. But the opposite's happening. And so I think the best way, and this is where I really kind of thought veteran studies was an important addition to a college curriculum, for civilians to help veterans fall into these positive tracks as opposed to negative tracks is to not knowledge. You know, there's no reason why veterans have to be the ones fixing all these veteran problems. Like civilians right. can learn about the GI Bill, they can learn about the crisis line, they can yeah. learn about you know, all these different uh, community level programs. Like I work at the DAV in Madison County. It's a small chapter, yeah. it's a, but it's a good place for veterans to just show up. Every Friday at 8 a.m., by the way, if you're a veteran in Madison County, please stop by. We have a free breakfast just for you. There you go. That kind of stuff, you know, word of mouth. Uh, making sure that veteran feels not alone, not a burden, and like they have a purpose. And that can go a long way. Okay. Um, <clears throat> 
because we when you talk about that you talk about you know how we can start that word of mouth in education do you think that maybe at like the high school level or you know because unfortunately a lot of people go into the military right out of high school because you know either family or you know some people will, will say i did it for you know x x or x uh, money or, or whatever or because they pay for your education afterwards do you think in high school we could talk about or we should talk about things like that or maybe at the community college level like as part of like a fye like first year experience of, you know you, you know, can do something to say you're an instructor and you have a day that you have slaughtered aside just for something creative to do in class you could have a veteran theme class that like about the things i just talked about um you know high school it gets a little tricky i'm pretty sure there's some community or school boards that would probably hear about the kinds of stuff that i taught at the college level <laughs> uh taught war violence sexual right. assault uh, ptsd suicide i don't know if that's going to make it a public school curriculum honestly but it's telling yeah. that that's what keeps our society running right right that we can't talk about it um <clears throat> swindlers <laughs> uh and then, uh, you know, I, I talked about how you, you have your teaching curriculum for War and Homecoming. Um, if we were to try to expand on your work to change the preconceived notions of veteran studies uh, to better educate the general public, um, what do you think would be the best place to start uh, outside of, like, you know, directing people to your book or teaching the book or, or things like that? Anybody can do it in world history. You don't have to take a college class and do one. Most of your local uh, colleges have an oral history program. A lot of public libraries do. Um, there's lots of resources and guides online. Uh, that, that is stuff you can do it with a phone, right? Um, and I'll tell you what, every semester I was teaching the class, there would be a student who selected a veteran, and the veteran would die before the end of the semester, and they would not get to record the interview, and that veteran's story would not be told. So that's, go listen, go ask a veteran. Tell them authentically. They're not gonna dive under a table and freak out. And if they do, tell them about the benefits that are available to them. Because, you know, it's like, if it's a problem, you're avoiding it either way. Right. You know, it's like we, we say, well, I don't want to upset the veteran. Veterans don't talk about it. Veterans need to talk about it. Uh, to the degree they're comfortable, of course. You don't have to go yeah. in and just ask them the worst thing that ever happened to you. Did you ever kill anyone? Questions like that. Of course, that's stupid, right? You don't do that. But why did you join? Uh, how did service uh, change you? What, what are some things about service that you miss? Stuff like that, you know, just really give them the opportunity to lead the conversation, listen. And listening is really more important than anything you have to say. You know, I always say, you know, you can learn a lot more by listening than talking. I agree with that 100%. Um, what kind of resources that. would you give? She's laughing. I always I said that this morning. <laughs> Did you? <laughs> <laughs> what kind of, uh, if you were, like, what kind of resources would you want to, like, plug for people, you know, if, like, we could create links or whatever for people to like click on, you know, anything that you would want people to know about? Uh, sure. I, for, for your community, I would make sure that they know about the, the, the resources here on the community college campus. Uh, you have a space, you have a resources benefits officer. I uh, can't remember her name, but she was the same one that did mine, and she was very nice, and she helped me. Uh, she's, uh, in terms of homecoming, those small interactions, you know, you, yeah. you can make a small difference in one conversation. You can choose to make that conversation as superficial and get your serotonin boost, or you can use it to like make someone know you genuinely care about them. I encourage you to do the latter. Um, in terms of other benefits, there's lots of local uh, veteran service organizations or VSOs, uh, things like the Veterans of Foreign Wars Post here in Pulaski County. There's uh, I, I don't remember where they're all at. There's an American Legion here. There's there's DAV likely has a chapter here too. But there's, these things are pretty common. Uh, make sure you know where those are. Make sure you know what the crisis line number is, 988, to press one if you're a veteran. Uh, but um, basically just uh, be ready to adapt on the fly. You know, it's not a script. Uh, but be authentic. Like if you're gonna take the time to have a conversation with someone, be ready to stay there and listen. It's not something you can just like start and be, hope it doesn't go south or something. Right. Like if you're gonna be a real person to someone, be there. Like, simple as that. That's what our society has lost. And it's not just about veterans. Right. And like you said, because it, it uh, learning about veterans is learning about just the human experience in general. And even more so than that, because I, I know there you've got something that you have on your uh, website as uh, 
if you've met one veteran, you've met one veteran. Mm-hmm. You, you have not met all veterans, and everyone's story is different. Yep. And how their service has impacted them, and not just their service, but their life in general has has affected them in general. Um, what's next for for you two? Uh, currently, I'm, I'm going to continue doing workshops. I just I just got trained in another modality called Safe Talk. It's a two hour kind of uh, prevention based uh, workshop. The other one I do is intervention based, so it's two days. So I'm training like four or five of these now, and I'm doing those again where I can. I'm also, again, working with the DAV. I'm hoping to get them some grant money this year to help with their operations and maybe develop an educational program that okay. would span a year or two uh, to kind of, like, focus on, like, the knowledge, equipping not just the veterans in the chapter but their family and their immediate circles to come in and learn about the things that we've been talking about today. That's so that's kind of what I'm doing with my time right now. Okay. What about you, Dr. Day? I'm currently spending my sabbatical semester editing, putting the final touches on um, an Appalachian Studies open electronic resource. Okay. So the App Studies will, the Intro to App Studies course, will have a free textbook That's to awesome. anyone around the world who wants to access it. Okay. And they don't even have to be in a college class in order okay. to access the book. That's so awesome. it's I'm expecting it to be released in April. Okay. Can't wait. Will it be towards the end of April, beginning of April? Don't know yet. Okay. April. Okay. April is fine. <laughs> it's been a big project. Uh, right. It's a huge exciting. project. It's huge. Uh, I'm excited for that, especially do we have more information on it uh, at Arno? Possibly. Possibly. Because I know Arno's at the well, Arno's at the end of March. That'd be a good crowd so to let know. It we would, would love to, would. to have that information if you could find out more idea. about it. Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, one of my former students, Samuel Lewis, started a podcast. Uh, like as you all know, it's a great, great way to learn about people. Yeah. We'll talk and listen. It's called Service to Service. It was part of his uh, uh, getting his program. Uh, you know, you can do like specialized educational experiences, like internships and things. Okay. And so he chose to do start a podcast. It's pretty good. It's got about twenty episodes now. Okay. It's good stuff. We'll have to plug that at the end, too. We'll, we'll uh, do a link to it. That way people can go in and, and continue this this journey. Because that's the whole point of, of starting this is, again, taking it back to the stories. The, and the power of stories is, you know, being able to, to further the conversation and how we can help others. You know, uh, and also, I just want to say a special thank you to James Taylor and the administrators at Somerset Community College for helping bring me in. Uh, Lynn Shearer for helping them remember who I am. Uh, Wanda Freeze, people like that. Uh, professors I had in class basically told the people that run this place that he's got <laughs> a cool story to share, and they let me. That's so awesome. if it hadn't been for their generosity and their willingness to listen, I, none yeah. of this would have been possible. That's awesome. Well, I'll definitely have to, to reach out to Mr. Taylor because uh, he's he's a, a good good hoot to talk to. He is. Uh, I love talking to him. Uh, good example of a veteran who could tell a story. Yeah, yes, <laughs> very much so. Uh, but thank you both for coming today, and, and uh, I can't wait to see what you all decide to do next after this, after you finish your editing and, mm-hmm. and with your uh, your studies and, and your prevention uh, classes that you're taking. Uh, do you have any speaking arrangements coming up? I'm speaking at the Universalist Fellowship in Madison County, I think, in a couple of weeks. Okay. Uh, I, I, I'm going to the Veterans and Society Conference in a couple of weeks in South Carolina. I was, my book was a, a runner-up for a big award. Uh, so That's awesome. I'm really excited about that. Uh, less so about the award than just knowing people are reading my book and saying things about I've it. I've seen a lot of the I've seen a lot of the anecdotes that, yes. that uh, people write about for it. it it's very well received. It's cool. Uh, you know, I, I just wanted to get across the finish yeah. line when I was writing <laughs> it. Man. I was like, man, am I ever going to get this thing done? Are they actually going to publish it? I didn't believe it until I saw it print, you know. No, no, I actually wrote a, a halfway decent book. It's, 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 it's you know, it's, uh, it's, it's heartwarming. Do you want to write another one? I do. You do want to write another I do, one? I do. I don't know when. Not right now, but right. at some point. I'm what about the Chautauqua series? The state Chautauqua lectures? Yeah, that's that's the humanities, uh, uh, the, the humanities speakers bureau I'm doing for the Kentucky. Uh, Humanities Council. Kentucky Humanities Council. That's actually the talk with the Universalist Fellowship is through them. So okay. that's one way to book me for talks and workshops. Again, anybody just reach out to me. My website is travislmartin.com. Okay. It's easy to remember. Yeah. And you're also on WhatsApp, according to your website. I am. Yeah, I need, <laughs> I need to get that link working. It's probably not working right now. I changed my phone number since I put that on there. Fair enough. But we have, I just want to thank you both for coming. I hope you both have a wonderful day, and we'll see you at uh, Arno, hopefully. See you there. Thanks.
more information on the SEC student newspaper, The Bridge, or the Gateway Video Podcast, email us at secthebridge at yahoo.com or contact one of the course advisors. This is The Gateway, signing out.